Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Uh, today, it's an honor to have RJ Joyce uh, talk about his ongoing research in feature extraction and analysis of malware. I remind everybody that on Friday, May 5th, is the CSEE Research Day. 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., both online and in ECS atrium, and that includes a free lunch. I encourage everybody to attend. So, RJ, please proceed. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sherman. Um, so, that was a great introduction. Um, I'm RJ Joyce. I'm a PhD student here at UMBC, um, studying under Dr. Nicholas and Dr. Edward Raff. Um, this work was done jointly between the Dream Lab at UMBC, which focuses on malware analysis and also uh, uh, co-performed uh, with Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, so the motivations for this work, um, when we are talking about malware, we're talking about ginormous scales of new malicious files every single day. Um, we may observe over 100,000 uh, over 100,000 previously unseen malicious unique files every single day. And the data sets used for storing and querying all of this data um, may have hundreds of millions or even billions of files in them. So um, we have some very frequent queries that we want to make, especially um, queries like, let's start with one particular malicious file and try to find other files that are related to it. Um, we call this malware nearest neighbor lookup. Um, we would do that for things like trying to um, investigate a particular malware family and seeing how it's changing over time. We might need to do that for um, trying to find existing analysis of a similar file or for tracking different malicious campaigns. We have other common uh, tasks on this data as well, things like trying to classify malware by family or by category, trying to cluster malware into groups of related samples, um, et cetera. And for pretty much all of these tasks, the input is what we call a feature vector. It's basically the base um, format of input used in machine learning. So a feature vector is essentially a list of numbers where those numbers somehow describe the data point, in this case being a malicious file. And it's not exactly obvious how you'd go from a malicious file to a particular list of numbers describing it. Um, there's a lot of different approaches, um, things like looking at just the raw bytes in the file and interpreting those as the feature vector, um, trying to um, use file metadata or uh, or kind of information about the file as a way of uh, featureizing it. You can get into some higher detail ways of analyzing the file and getting features from it by doing things like running the file. We call that dynamic analysis um, and kind of looking at like which API calls did the malware make as it ran or um, what kind of broad behavioral things did it do. Or we could try disassembling the file in a tool like IDAPRO or Ghidra and looking at features from the, uh, the disassembly or the decompilation and using those for representing the files. So unfortunately, all of these have drawbacks. Um, the more detailed approaches like dynamic analysis or assembly um, don't scale to the sizes that we need. We can't just disassemble 1 billion files or run 1 billion files in a sandbox because it would take far too much long, to, uh, far too much long of a time. Um, and then we can't use or rely on some of the simpler approaches because they might be limited by like file format or they might not give us um, high enough levels of uh, features, they might just be kind of looking at individual bits and bytes without telling us the broad picture. Um, so those are kind of the motivations here. We want a way of creating a feature vector for a malicious file, um, but we want to kind of try a new format of data or a new source of features that hasn't been attempted before. Um, also, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. You can either ask in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask. Um, totally happy to uh, to answer anything anyone's confused on. Um, but for now, as long as everyone's okay with the motivation, I'll move on. So let me pull up the chat in WebEx just to make sure I can see things. Okay. Um, all right. So don't feel shy if you have any questions. Um, and that's kind of the broad um, uh, information about why we're doing this research. All right. So the format we want to use is something called an antivirus scan report. Um, the idea is we're going to take one particular malicious file and we're going to scan it with a large collection of different antivirus products. So each different antivirus product will give us an output based on what that antivirus product thinks about the malicious file. So for example, on the right, 
you can see um, kind of a an example antivirus report from 10 different antivirus products. We had 10 different antiviruses that all detected this file as malicious. Um, and each of their labels have a different format and have some different types of information in them. You'll notice they're not all um, in agreement with each other. The top five la uh, labels seem to indicate that this is some kind of Trojan or ransomware um, targeting the Windows operating system. And in particular, they identify the family as malware as WannaCry, although you'll notice there's a couple different uh, versions of the name WannaCry, like WannaCrypt or just WCry. Um, so kind of consolidating all of this information, um, there's not just one kind of broadly accepted format for these labels or one broadly accepted way of naming things. Um, the bottom five labels, uh, the bottom five labels don't um, have any information about, about the malware family, but they do have other, a little more broadly informative uh, uh, content. So things like that this malware uses an exploit called Eternal Blue for spreading, um, which is also kind of named under its vulnerability CVE 2017-0147. So two of these labels don't have the malware family, but they know this is using a particular exploit, um, which is also valuable information. Um, label eight, trojan.tr slash ransom.gen, just says it's ransomware. It's more of a heuristic signature, um, uh, where, or sorry, a heuristic label that doesn't really tell us what family or what it's doing, but they think it's ransomware. Number nine is a little bit less informative. It behaves like just generic malware. So they know it's malicious, but they really don't know what it is. Um, and then label 10 is just wrong about the family. They could think it's in the Arbot family, which is not related to WannaCry. Um, so you can get some conflicting, um, possibly erroneous information in these reports, but it's also a very broad, useful source of information about um, kind of high level features of the file that was scanned. So um, basically the larger of collections of antivirus products you have for these uh, scan reports, the more varied and possibly informative the information is. And our goal is we want to take all of this information, all of the information inside of this report and condense it down into one single vector. The idea is every single antivirus label comes from some particular signature, which is like a sequence of bytes or a, or a set of strings that they're looking for in the malware um, or using a particular heuristic or some other way of detecting the malware. So if two different malware samples are given the same antivirus label, they were detected using the same means and there's some type of relationship between those two files. The more antivirus labels two files have in common, basically the, the more features they share. Um, and so we can say that if two files share very similar antivirus scan reports, they're almost certainly related in some way. And we could take advantage of that um, with our uh, feature extraction. Is everyone okay with kind of this idea? Um, we have antivirus scan reports by taking one malware sample and scanning them with a ton of different antivirus products. And if two malware samples get pretty much the same output in these reports, uh, they're probably related. Um, so we're going to talk about our solution, which we call AV scan to vec um, There's a bunch of these two vec uh, machine learning models out there, which take some kind of source of data and convert them to a vector. So you have like word to vec which is trying to take a word and convert it to a vector, or um, node to vec which takes a, a node in a graph and makes a vector representing it, um, or even uh, like code to vec will take a line of code and try to vectorize that. So in this case, we are converting antivirus scan data to a vector. Um, the idea is it should do this encoding in a way that's useful to us. So um, similar scan reports should encode into similar vectors that are nearby each other in Euclidean space. Um, the way we do this encoding is using a transformer. So the transformer um, is nowadays considered kind of like the, the leading architecture for a lot of different natural language processing tasks. If you're familiar with any of the GPT, whatever that are coming out these days, uh, the T is for transformer. They essentially take a sequence of input tokens and can do some very powerful things uh, regarding the relationships between those tokens and give outputs based on that. Um, so we are taking this antivirus scan data. Uh, we're taking advantage of its structure um, and um, we're going to be applying a transformer encoder to it uh, and aggregating the results of that encoder to get a single vector. So there's a lot of different steps that need to happen to do this. I'll be going over each of those during the, the following slides. Um, but first of all, we have to do some pre-processing on our raw data. So every single antivirus scan report is made up of some number of distinct antivirus labels. 
um, one label per every antivirus product, although it's also possible for an antivirus product to um, not detect the file that's malicious, so you might get an empty label. Um, and we also account for cases where antivirus products are missing, where they just didn't scan the file. So um, but essentially, we have a collection of different antivirus labels, one per antivirus product within these reports. And we have to pre-process every single one of those labels into a format that we can use for machine learning. Um, so at step one, can everyone, uh, can you see my mouse? Um, I don't have the video up, so yeah, all right, thank you. Um, so if you can see step one, we have our um, kind of our original antivirus label. So in this case, the example is from the previous one, trojan.win32.wannacry.some series of numbers. We are going to take that initial label and we're going to tokenize it and normalize it. So we're going to take um, each of the non-alphanumeric characters in the label and use them as um, delimiters. So we're going to separate the label on each of those and then convert all the tokens into lowercase. And that's all the pre-processing. Um, we try to um, not be heavy handed at all and kind of just work with the raw format as much as possible of the antivirus labels. We're going to take each of those tokens. Um, we have a maximum length, which we denote L. Um, so we will add padding if necessary to um, pad the length of each of those label tokens um, out to the maximum length. Um, and we're also going to have special tokens um, indicating the start of the label and the end of the label. Um, so right here, you can see a special start of label token, which we call SOS. And then the, the token also indicates which antivirus product reduced this label. So SOS VI robot. There's a different start of label token um, for each different antivirus product, uh, which we'll explain why we have that later. So you can see the start of sentence token. You can see each of the individual tokens in the label. There's an end of label. And then we have padding to take it to the maximum length of seven by default. Um, most antivirus labels don't get longer than five tokens, plus two for the start and end. Um, so that's where we cap it off. We will truncate any labels that do get longer than that. But for the most part, any information at the end of the label is generally some kind of suffix, which doesn't give us a lot of information compared to the remainder of the, the beginning of the label. Um, next up, we do um, an additional set of pre-processing. We, um, we observe, so we have a data set of all of this scan data with about 40 million anti, uh, antivirus scan reports in it. Um, we observe over 1.1 billion unique antivirus labels and over, I think also 40 million unique tokens. Um, so we have millions and millions of these tokens. Um, the traditional way you would kind of convert these tokens to a way um, machine learning could deal with would you just give each token an, a unique number. So like all of the Trojan tokens would be number like five, for example, and all the win 32 would be number 10. Um, in this case, because we have so many of them, because the vocabulary is so large, you have to take a different approach. Um, we use um, an existing architecture called character BERT. It's a way of um, applying a transformer uh, where you don't really um, want to restrict your vocabulary. You kind of allow an open-ended vocabulary where new tokens can be introduced. Um, and what it does is we're going to take each token, we're going to split it into characters. So you can see each character in the token WannaCry. We'll have another unique uh, character token for the start of the, the word and the end of the word, along with padding to the maximum token length. And each character gets a unique number representing um, what that character is. Um, character BERT uses um, convolution over these um, to produce a vector for the entire token out of those characters. Um, but the way it does this allows for similar tokens to be mapped into similar embedding vectors for that token. Um, it allows us to have an open vocabulary where there's no limit and the model can still work if newly, um, like previously unseen tokens are introduced. Um, and uh, it will also produce similar, uh, similar embeddings for tokens with similar semantic meaning. So at this very final step here in step six, um, the notation we're using, this E with a uh, arrow over it, represents a vector for a particular token. Um, so by the end of this pre-processing, we've obtained a, um, a vector embedding representing each token in the antivirus label. Are there any questions up to this point? We're getting into some heavy machine learning stuff, um, but this is kind of a, uh, a typical approach for, um, for most transformers. We have to take each token either in like our sentence on, on like English data 
um, or in this case, each token in our antivirus label and convert it to a uh, vector embedding representing that token. And the model will learn and adjust these embeddings um, as it trains. Okay. So that's the pre-processing. Um, so at this point, we have um, we have embeddings for each token and each antivirus label. Um, we have some number of antivirus labels in each report, so we can deal with some number of antivirus products. Um, so for if you can see my mouse, each antivirus label is pre-processed and contributes um, L tokens, where L is the maximum length of the label in tokens. Um, and then for some number of those labels, we'll say that we have A different labels, and we're going to make a sequence out of them. So um, these are kind of ordered. Each antivirus product goes in a deterministic place in that sequence. Um, we just do it alphabetically. And then that sequence is begun with a special token called CLS. Um, that token is essentially always placed there and exactly there in the, the sequence. And we'll talk about it later, but it's used for, um, it's used for aggregating information from the entire sequence. Um, so it doesn't really represent anything yet, but as the model trains, it will learn to kind of um, encode the meaning of the entire report um, using that token. So again, we have this special CLS token as the beginning of our entire sequence for our entire scan report. Uh, we have the embeddings for each individual antivirus label um, for some number of labels, which we call A. Um, so you can see here, uh, these are used as input to a transformer encoder. And the outputs of the transformer encoder are in the exact same shape. So we're going to get the outputs from the, the last layer of the encoder and use them for two different tasks. We call the first task masked label prediction and the second task masked token prediction. I'll explain each of those in a separate slide. Um, but basically the output corresponding to the CLS token is going to be used for the masked label prediction task and the output for the remainder. So the outputs for each of the A antivirus labels um, will be used for the other task masked token prediction. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, so that's kind of the setup we have with our model architecture. Next, I'm going to describe the two um, learning tasks that teach the model about the structure of the data. Um, this is something called self-supervised learning where you don't have any labels, um, but you can use kind of the structure of the data to teach the model about the data itself. So what we're going to do, um, the first task is what we call masked token prediction. It's the one up here um, where we're going to be using the transformers outputs for each of the embedded antivirus labels. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take about 5% of these tokens and we're going to replace them with a special token called mask, which essentially hides that token from the model. So we're basically hiding 5% of these tokens from the model, they'll get encoded and using the outputs of the model in that position, we'll use those to ask the model, hey, predict what should have gone here. Um, if the model is accurate, great. If it predicted the right tokens, great. Um, if it got them incorrect, that will be built into the loss calculation for the model as it trains. Um, and it will basically improve um, learning from the semantics and the other tokens in the report that it can observe, um, kind of how to fill in the missing gaps. So this is again, self-supervised learning. We're taking the structure of this data, having the model teach itself, um, kind of trying to figure out what tokens should be there that we held out. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? And by doing this, we teach the model kind of what token to expect in certain places, what tokens appear after other tokens, um, kind of the tokens that certain antivirus products like to use, et cetera. So that's mass token prediction. The other task we call masked label prediction. So with masked label prediction, um, we want to represent the entire scan report as a vector. So we have, as I mentioned before, the special CLS token embedding. Um, this token um, is always placed at the very beginning of every sequence. It's going to be encoded using the transformer. And the transformer has something called self-attention. Basically, it can look at all of the other inputs um, that were given to it and see which ones are relevant and kind of computed a weighted average of all of the outputs. Um, to kind of give us this output vector in a way that summarizes the entire sequence. 
Um, so basically any important or notable parts of the sequence um, are kind of encoded into this final output representing the entire scan report. So this is kind of our, oops, this C right here is kind of our entire vector representing the full scan report. And we learn good vectors that represent each um, antivirus uh, scan report based on how we train the model. Um, the way we actually set up this problem, instead of just holding out individual tokens, we're going to mask out an entire label, uh, just one label randomly from the entire scan report. Um, so one entire label or seven tokens are going to be completely masked out. And using the remainders of the labels, we have to generate what that missing label would have been. Um, for this, we use something called auto regression. Um, we're going to prompt an LSTM or a long short term memory uh, neural network with the first token in a label that will be that special start of label antivirus token. We're basically telling it, all right, here's the antivirus label, or sorry, here's the antivirus product we want you to predict for and generate us the rest of the label. So we'll feed in the first token, it'll give us an output of the next token, we'll feed in that token, it'll give us the following token until we've generated up to seven tokens. It can also tell us that we want to stop early and say, this label is done, we've generated the entire thing. Um, so we use this auto regressive task to um, kind of hide entire labels and have the model regenerate the missing label from the start. And this again helps the model learn representations for the full scan report. Um, any questions up to this point? Okay. Oh, um, Richard asks, what program am I using to allow it to learn? Um, so this is implemented in Python and specifically with a library called PyTorch. So PyTorch is a um, pretty well-known machine learning framework where you can um, do, uh, um, you can basically kind of make custom neural networks however you want, and they give you really good support with a lot of the common building blocks. So basically I can just drag a, a transformer encoder in there, tell the model how all of this kind of proceeds in a forward pass, um, and then it will automatically figure out how to, given the lost, um, update the model as it trains and, and teach it to learn better representations for the vector. Did that answer your question? Yeah, PyTorch is awesome. Um, Okay. Um, so at this point, um, we have the model giving us a very reasonable vector that summarizes the report. We want to make some guarantees about um, the overall structure of the vectors we get. And in particular, we want to make sure that if we get um, vectors for similar uh, malware samples, those vectors themselves should be close by. Um, and this is mostly already kind of done by the pre-training step, but we want to ensure this using a second phase of training called fine tuning. So at this point, we've got a pre-trained model that can learn all these token semantics. It can learn to pretty well summarize entire reports, um, but we want to ensure that, um, we want to ensure that pairs of related malware samples will be encoded into similar vectors. Um, the way this works, we take our um, AV scan to vec model that to be a pre-trained, we're going to make it into what's called a Siamese network structure. So we're basically going to have uh, two copies of the network and we're going to feed them batches of related pairs of malware samples. So we have to identify pairs of related malware samples and um, basically each pair will be um, one particular location in a batch of these. So we might use, for example, I think we use by, um, by default 100 pairs of these related malware samples in each batch. So we'll have an anchor batch. These are what we consider kind of a ground truth starting point. Um, so we'll have 100 malware samples in this batch. And then the positive batch is um, a batch of another 100 malware samples that um, each malware sample in that one particular position is a matching similar related malware sample to whatever was in that position in the anchor. Um, so we'll use each of these as input to AV scan -DVEC. We'll get as output batches of 100 um, vectors uh, for both the anchor batch and the positive batch. And then we're going to apply a loss function called the multiple negatives ranking loss. So the idea is um, that the vectors for the related uh, malware samples, those pairs, 
um, they should be encouraged to learn that the vectors will be similar to each other. And then everything else in the batch, um, even though we don't have good labels for like specifically what types of malware they are, um, it's unlikely just due to how much variety of malware is out there that anything else in the batch will be related. So what we do is we teach the model to distance the vectors from all of the other unrelated malware in the batch. So again, um, the positive vector is going to be drawn toward the anchor point, making sure that those two vectors for the related malwares are, um, are moved towards each other. And also we're going to take um, uh, the positive point and make sure that it's distanced from all of the other unrelated samples. Does that kind of make sense? Basically fine tuning how each vector is represented, making sure that vectors for similar samples are in similar close by regions of Euclidean space while unrelated malware is distanced from those vectors. Okay, um, we actually observe some pretty cool patterns when doing this. Um, it turns out the model is able to, um, to work at different levels of granularity. So we observe that similar, like two malware samples in the same family are located very close together, but also we observe like broadly all of the ransomware kind of goes into one place. Um, all of like the Trojans go into another place. All the key loggers kind of have their own broad area. Um, so it's not just drawing together similar malware families, but also um, broad types of malware are kind of like all lumped together, which is a pretty cool finding. Okay. Um, so that was all about the architecture. Now we'll talk about the actual details of how we trained it and how we evaluated it. Um, am I doing okay on time? I've got to like one, right? This is about halfway through my presentation. Um, so the way we trained it, okay. Um, so we had, oh, sorry, about 30 million virus total reports. Um, so virus total is Google's, um, online malware analysis platform. You can upload a file to it and it will scan your file with about 70 different antivirus products and give you the results for them. Using the virus total API, we made queries for about 30 million, um, samples from virus total. Um, these are in a known data set called the virus share data set. Um, and we got scan reports from malware all the way going back from uh, May 2006 up to December 2021. Um, over time, virus total has changed which antivirus products they are using. So normally your scan report has about 70 antivirus products in it, but there were some that were added in or taken out. So um, what we're looking at is about 88 different distinct antivirus products that we used um, as part of our training. Um, we trained the model on four NVIDIA Quadro RTX 8000 GPUs for about eight days, which um, was training for about five epochs over the entire data set. Um, so in effect, we trained it on um, basically about 150 million scan reports. Um, again, we observed over 1.1 billion unique, uh, or 1.1 billion non-unique labels in this data. Um, so after pre-training, we measured the accuracy of both of our um, both of our prediction tasks using an additional three million scan reports that were held out from training. Um, so when doing mass token prediction, again, this is hold out tokens and predict which ones were missing. We had an accuracy of about eighty nine point seven four percent, so just shy of ninety percent accuracy. When I hold out a token and ask the model to predict what that missing token was. Um, for mass label prediction, where I have to generate the entire label from scratch, um, it was an accuracy of about 82% because this is a more challenging problem. We're not just trying to predict one label, um, or sorry, one token, but if we have any errors, those can kind of cascade down to future points in the, uh, the autoregressive prediction. We also measured out various sizes of different representations for the malware. So the malicious data set we were working with, um, the um, this was actually a separate data set of about 7 million malware samples, which we use for further evaluation at a different point. Um, but the raw malicious files um, as part of that data set took up about just shy of 14 terabytes. The virus total reports um, containing the antivirus scan information for this data were about 140.6 gigabytes, so much smaller than just storing the raw executable files. There are two other feature vector formats that we compare our results to. The first is called the Burroughs-Wheeler Markov distance. 
Um, the BWMD or Burroughs Wheeler Markov distance vector um, is a feature vector of size 65,000. Um, and it is calculated just based on the raw bytes in the file. So it's nice because you don't have to be restricted by a particular file format. Um, but it can't as easily observe higher level features of malware because it's operating on those raw bytes. And the feature vector size is very, very large. So you'll notice we didn't get very much space saving um, when comparing the size of the raw files to the feature vectors for those files. Um, there's a different feature vector format um, called the Ember format, which is about 2,800 features in the feature vector. Um, this format uh, in Ember is based on PE header metadata, so the, the metadata within portable executable files for Windows. So it is restricted to Windows executables. Um, it doesn't work on other types of malware um, that might be targeting like Linux or Mac or Android, and it doesn't work with uh, non-PE Windows malware like malicious scripts, so you can't use it for that either. Um, AV Scandivec um, has a feature dimension of 768, so about three times smaller than Ember and nearly 100 times smaller than the BWMD vector. Um, this allows it to be stored in memory without uh, as many memory requirements, and also any comparisons between vectors are faster because they are smaller. Um, that was one of our main uh, goals, was um, kind of condensing very useful information into a smaller vector format. Um, to test that our pre-training um, was valid, we wanted to do a lot of validation, um, making sure that there weren't any cases where prediction failed um, or degraded past the point of being acceptable. So we basically first wanted to make sure that there were no antivirus products for which AV Scandivec failed to predict vectors for or predict tokens or labels for. Um, so what we did is we basically took our mass token prediction task and mass label prediction tasks separated them out based on the accuracy per antivirus product and, and kind of validated that way. So um, mass token prediction, if you remember, was nearly 90% on average. Um, it did vary based on antivirus products, based on kind of which formats were less regular or um, or which used kind of more challenging um, or, uh, or um, more varying uh, label outputs. So there's an antivirus product called Jiangmin, um, which was the lowest accuracy of 77.51 for predicting tokens. Um, there's a very easy format for Silence where they basically just detect if it's malware or not, but don't give you any extra data. So the, the labels for that are almost 100% predictable because they're nearly always identical. For generating an entire predicted antivirus label, um, the lowest accuracy was for the Norman antivirus product, most likely, again, because um, it is a challenging and irregular label format. And the easiest was the Babable antivirus, uh, antivirus product, which had a very easy format to learn. Um, we also measured antivirus product. Uh, we, we measured accuracy based on the number of positive antivirus detections. So when I say positive detection, I mean that an antivirus product detected the, the sample as malware. So some malware goes um, very undetected, where few antivirus products actually recognize that it's malware. Um, other malware samples get like almost complete coverage, where every single antivirus product knows that it's malware. And we checked the accuracy of AV Scandivec during pre-training for both of our tasks. Um, based on the number of positive detections. So you'll notice, um, in general, the accuracies for both mass token prediction and mass label prediction are very correlated. Um, you'll notice that they generally increase um, uh, as we add more positive detections, but it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty um, noisy. We have a very interesting trend for mass label prediction where it kind of spikes when there's few, like between like three to seven labels in the report. Um, then kind of drops and then uh, increases again. Um, one possible explanation for this is that um, it's easier to aggregate a scan report when there are fewer labels in it um, without losing much information kind of per label. Whereas when you have these very packed reports, um, generally most of the antivirus products will be in consensus because it's a very well-known, well-studied family of malware. And so you'll get kind of like this interesting U-shape because of those factors. But in general, um, one of the cool findings we found was even when scan reports had just two labels in them and we held one of those labels out for prediction, the model was still over 70% accurate when generating the missing label, even only having information about one other label in the report. So even under very restrictive conditions um, where almost no information was available to us in the report, um, the model was still able to train and learn and complete its tasks with pretty good accuracy which is one of the findings we are very impressed with. 
Um, we tried splitting our training data set and our testing data set by month. Um, so for this one, we can see over our test data, um, the accuracy of each of our tasks based on the month of that scan. Um, so um, you'll notice here with most of our very old data, um, the accuracy lowers. It's still able to, to complete the tasks, but um, you'll definitely notice, like especially mass label prediction, um, that does make many more errors in this area. And one of the reasons for this is we just have far less data per month in this uh, prior to like 2011. Um, we might only have a few thousand scan reports from these months versus potentially like hundreds of thousands or millions for some of the, the more recent months. So that's one of the reasons for the degradation here was just lack of training data. And you'll notice there's also a bit of a fall off in the most recent months up here. The reason for this is that antivirus products um, aren't quite as great at detecting the newest malware. Um, so a lot of the scan reports here were uh, generated recently after the malware was discovered before antivirus labels could stabilize. Um, you'll see a lot of heuristic labels in these reports without as many signature-based ones where antivirus products have gone back and said, yeah, we need to study this malware, find unique strings in it, and, and kind of improve our detections for it. Um, so you'll notice kind of that trend for kind of emerging malware where um, it's harder to predict what the labels are going to be. Um, we did a little bit more validation. So we retrained the entire model um, where we did a temporal split of the data. So we held out um, all of the data after June 2020 for the testing set. And the model was trained on all of the training data from prior to June 2020. And we asked the model to predict labels that kind of were quote unquote in the future for it that it had never seen before. Um, it starts off very strong before dropping, but you'll notice that even um, even for um, antivirus scan reports that were about a year and a half in the model's you know, quote unquote future, um, it was still reasonably able to predict entire antivirus labels um, with, with good accuracy for the challenging um, nature of this task. So we wanted to make sure that we could employ AV scan devec and it wouldn't degrade immediately like to a point of unusability. Um, we do still expect that this is something that would probably be best if trained and retrained monthly on new antivirus scan data so it can keep up with kind of the, the latest trends, which new malware families are emerging or what common things we see. Um, because in this set of data, there are definitely new malware families that did not exist in the old data, which are kind of contributing to the lowered accuracy. Um, does anyone have any questions about the pre-training results before I move on? So following this, we have results for the fine-tuned model. So remember, after fine-tuning, we got it to recognize that um, uh, vectors for similar malware samples should be encoded into vectors of similar location in the Euclidean space. Um, we identified 5 million pairs of related malware samples. We did this using a similarity hash called the trend locality sensitive hash. This is a, um, a similarity metric meant specifically for malicious files. Um, with a very, very low false positive rate, um, like lower than, uh, I think it's like 0.05% false positive rate of, of their evaluation. It doesn't always have the ability to identify related malware. Um, if you change malware uh, enough, the, uh, the, the similarity hash will break and fail to identify them. Um, but it is a very good way of identifying pairs of malicious files with high confidence. So we can be confident that as we're training the model, um, pretty much every pair of malicious files we're seeing during this stage are probably belong to the same family or very related in some way with, with nearly identical contents. Um, so fine tuning took about 20 hours. We used one Quadro RTX 8000 GPU on these 5 million pairs of, uh, of, um, of scan reports. And by that point, the model had fine tuned with the ability to make sure that similar vectors um, should be in similar locations. Okay, um, results. So now we want to take AV scan devec and use it for a lot of different machine learning tasks. Um, we tried um, evaluating on clustering, classification, and nearest neighbor lookup for a variety of different common algorithms and models. Um, so first for uh, clustering and classification on malware families. So malware family um, classification or clustering is a common task to try to identify which related files belong to a particular family or to try to group them. Um, we used k-means clustering. Um, we 
basically would take each of the malware samples in a data set, um, in this case called the motif data set, which had about 3000 malware samples in them labeled by um, malware family with ground truth. We would encode those 3000 malware samples using these different means of vectorizing. Um, we also took the ember feature vector, which has categorical data based on um, file metadata, and we normalized it using PCA um, to apply dimensionality direction and normalization, um, which makes it better for a certain task. So we tried to improve Ember a little bit um, using a common normalization and um, dimensionality direction method, just to make sure we covered our bases. So in these cases, AV Scandivec has the highest homogeneity, completeness, and V measure for clustering when using K means um, over this data set. We also tried another common clustering method on the same data called hierarchical agglomerative clustering, um, which is a little bit better suited to malware data. And you notice again, in each of these cases, AV Scandivec has the highest homogeneity completeness and V measure. Um, and it also like reasonably exceeds um, each of the other approaches by an appreciable margin um, for, for some of these metrics. Um, and then finally, we trained a few different family classification models. Um, we trained a feed forward neural network on all of these feature vectors. Um, we also trained a tree based classifier called light GBM. So light GBM is a tree based ensemble, kind of like a decision tree, but, uh, sorry, a, um, a random forest, but a little more sophisticated. Um, and then we did one nearest neighbor classification, basically saying like, you know, if I give you this malware sample, um, give it the same label as the next nearest point in the data. Um, we did these each with five fold cross-validation um, to ensure that the results were okay and then average all the results. So the highest overall score was AV Scandivec with the feed forward neural network um, being able to perform family classification with almost exceeding or exceeding slightly 80% accuracy. Um, this is actually very strong for family classification since there were over 450 families in just 3000 samples. So um, it was a few shot learning task where there were not very many instances of each uh, training class. Um, light GBM, the highest scoring model was the raw ember vectors, which um, because these are categorical data, um, tree-based models tend to perform best on them, but AV Scandivec performed second highest, and it wasn't too far behind. And then for one nearest neighbor classification, AV Scandivec performed far better than the other models, um, having the ability to group pretty well um, and with, with a very simple approach um, related families. Um, after this, we tried um, a different task. So instead of malware family classification, we did behavioral tag classification. Um, so we have a data set called the Sorel data set. Um, it's about 7 million malicious PE files. And um, we encoded each of the malware samples in that data set using the different methods we were previously discussing. This data set has labels for 11 different classes based on the behavioral uh, kind of um, the behavior of these different malware samples. Uh, and it's possible for each malware sample to have multiple different behavioral tags. So this is a multi-label task. Um, so you'll see here things like adware, flutter, ransomware, dropper, spyware, et cetera. Um, and the challenge was for um, us to train classifiers that could detect kind of each of the different tags each of these malware samples were given. Um, we measured the rock area under the curve for a feed forward neural network and for a light GBM classifier. Um, AV Scandivec, when trained with a feed forward neural network, performed highest when measuring um, each of the 11 behavioral tags. And then it performed highest for eight of the 11 um, for the light GBM model. And again, Ember seems to be a little bit more suited for light GBM classifiers because it's using categorical data. Um, uh, but we still, in each of these cases, um, still performed, like this file in vector one was nearly identical with Ember slightly beating them out and the same for crypto miner. All right, um, the very final application we want to test with this and probably the one we're most excited about um, is for nearest neighbor lookup of malware. This is a task we think people use all the time. You know, um, analysts will have a data set of perhaps even a billion malware samples and they'll start with one malicious file they want to investigate and say, basically, hey, give me all of the related or relevant malware samples that are like this one. And this is one of the applications we think we have the most promise with when using AV Scandivec. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we have to first encode and vectorize an entire data set. So we vectorized 7.3 million scan reports from the Sorrel data set. And this took about six hours, um, uh, which is a, a linear time. Um, basically, you can encode um, each scan report in a fixed, uh, fixed length of time. And it could be sped up using additional GPUs or uh, more multiprocessing. From there, we applied an approach called uh, dynamic continuous indexing. So we built an index which could help uh, for searching related malware samples. There's this really great uh, paper on, on DCI or dynamic continuous indexing um, that can help really speed up the speed of nearest neighbor lookup queries. Um, and so it took only just above a minute to do this indexing over the entire data set. Um, and then from there, using um, our indexed feature vectors, we can do very, very fast querying. Um, it took on average about 16 milliseconds to look up the 10 nearest neighbors of an individual vector across this 7.3 million scan report data set. And one of the, the powerful things that DCI can do is it has uh, sublinear scaling. So even if we add orders of magnitude more um, files in our data set, um, the query time will not get that much substantially longer. So we can support extremely large data sets, possibly up to billions of files, um, without having that much of an impact when we're trying to query for them. Um, this is about 88 times faster than trying to brute force um, each of the uh, each of the uh, the vectors in the entire data set. And even though this is a little bit of heuristic, we saw almost no drop in the average F1 score um, when we were evaluating the effectiveness of this nearest neighbor lookup. So we have some of the results on the side um, showing our AV scan to vec um, precision recall and F1 score when doing 10 nearest neighbor lookup over this data. Um, all right. That's pretty much all I got. So a couple of conclusions. Um, we showed that we pretty solidly exceed some of the very popular approaches currently used for um, vectorizing malware in a, a variety of different tasks, such as family classification, category classification, uh, family clustering, nearest neighbor lookup, um, and with a variety of different common models. We think we're especially excited by combining AV scan to vec with dynamic continuous indexing for very fast lookup across large malware data sets. Um, right now, we have just finished querying um, the same data set of virus total reports, plus a bit extra um, uh, from virus total for uh, basically getting updated 2023 data set. We're retraining the model, and then we'll release it publicly in about a month once all the training is done. Um, and that's all I've got. So thank you for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions that I can answer? I'm curious to know, how does this work fit into your dissertation and what are your plans um, for future research? Yeah, so my dissertation is essentially um, the idea that I think antivirus scan data is really, really powerful and we can use it for a lot of common um, improvements to malware analyst life. So it kind of starts with this, this is the first paper that's going to be rolled into my dissertation um, where will say, you know, we can take these scan reports and use them for machine learning. Um, following that, we can also use these as a very good way of just kind of aggregating information about malware samples and kind of labeling it with tags, which can then be used for machine learning training. So um, some of the future work I've done after this is I've written about 800 different parsers for different common antivirus label formats, um, extracting out different types of information like, you know, this part of the label says it's you know targeting Windows, or this part of the label says it's using this exploit, or this part of the label says it's using this family. And based on that parts to aggregate uh, information, we can aggregate it and um, use it for kind of tagging and, and additional, um, and additional uh, ways of informing an analyst. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I hope that the uh, the machine learning explanation was reasonable. Um, I know for some people, they might have a varying amount of experience with machine learning. Um, so I hope if there's anything that I can re-explain or shed more light on, 
uh, just let me know because this is not easy material. Well, thank you very much. All right. Um, in thank two you. weeks, we'll be back, and Dr. Robot, Roberto Use will talk about his work on privacy. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.